Hello, I'm State Representative Jim Beakey from the 84th House District. Welcome to Ohio in Focus. Welcome to this edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. I'm your host, Brad Miller. Today I'm speaking with State Representative Jim Beakey, who serves the 84th House District, which includes all of Mercer County and parts of Audley's, Dark, and Shelby Counties. Representative, thanks for taking some time with us today. Well, Brad, it's a real privilege to be back. So the budget has been signed into law, um, a process that began in the House back in February, so it's quite a process to get to this point. Are you uh, rearing to start up on another one? Absolutely. Th th this is the second budget that I've been involved in since I came back in 2011, and what, we're, what we've done with this, uh, in this budget is to take the, all the good positive things from the first budget and now have implemented that so that we can continue the plan of the governor and the legislature to grow the economy and create more jobs. That's what we're about. Um, we're going to get into mostly the tax reform uh, sure. issues today. Can you uh, talk about some of the tax changes uh, beginning specifically with the uh, income and sales tax? Well, of course, uh, in, in this uh, process, there is at the state level a quarter of a percent increase in the state sales tax. So if you buy $100 worth of goods, that's going to cost you another 25 cents also in this budget is a reduction of the personal income tax and is scheduled for the next three years. The first year we're going to reduce the state's income tax by personal income tax by eight and a half percent. The second year by nine percent and the third year by ten percent. The whole idea here Brad is to to start shifting more from an income tax to a consumption tax. What we'd like to do is totally eliminate the state personal income tax for a variety of reasons. Um, can you talk about some of those reasons, uh, what the benefits are moving away from an income-based tax system to more of a consumption base, sure. as you well, mentioned? One of, the, one of the biggest, uh, the biggest business tax, the most important business tax we have in Ohio is the state personal income tax. And because it's because most businesses are small businesses uh, that are sole proprietorships or partnerships or or LTDs, uh, LLCs, and so on, where the personal income tax is the, the big driving tax. Uh, consumption tax is, is just simply paying the tax when you buy something. And so uh, what, what we want to do here, along with other measures in this tax package, is to lower the cost of doing business and the net effect of this reform package, as far as the tax, tax uh, changes are concerned, is uh, we're going to have over the biennium uh, uh, close to a three billion dollar tax reduction. This, this very first year, you're going to see a billion less state taxes to the 11 and a half million citizens of Ohio. So that's what we're we want to want to put more money in people's pockets, and that's what this is about. The 50% uh, income tax uh, on businesses. Some critics of the budget have said that that won't lead to significant hiring or any new hiring. Uh, what would be your response to that? My response to that is so far by what the program that we've initiated uh, under Governor Kasich's leadership, we've created over, 170, over 177,000 new jobs in the private sector. It works. And any time that you put more disposable income in people's pockets, the economy grows and jobs are created. That's just the reality. Um, moving to the uh, issue of property taxes, uh, there's a 12.5% property tax rollback. That's been uh, linked to the topic of transparency, greater government transparency. Can you explain how those two things are linked? Well, let me give you a little history. Uh, that 12.5%, uh, the 10% rollback, first 10% was put on back in 1971. And that was kind of a, a sweetener to obtain votes from the legislature to pass the personal income tax in the first place. And the personal income tax in the state was in 1971. Then later on they added uh, another 2.5% reduction. Well what that means is those are tax dollars that are being paid back to schools and others that have levies and uh, what it, it's 
people at home don't see that because they think it's, it's just something from the state. Well, the first year that that was in effect, it would cost the, uh, in the state budget $61 million uh, to give back to schools, basically, uh, for the, this, this uh, particular formula. Well, uh, last year, it, it had grown to a billion, one hundred million dollars. Well, that's still the, the, the taxpayers' money. It's just going to Columbus and then coming back. This way, you remove that so that everybody knows what's what. And what I believe is so huge about this in the future uh, is it's going to actually start a leveling off or an actual reduction in spending because that means less revenue coming in to, to spend. And, and the good, now here, here's the good news for, the, for this provision. It doesn't really, it doesn't start until uh, in, any new levies are put on the ballot and passed. In other words, everything that's in place, existing, uh, it stays. So that this is not a, a new tax on existing uh, levies that are in place. Um, on a similar topic, can you talk a little bit about uh, what is called the homestead tax exemption and uh, some of the changes that were made uh, regarding that policy? Originally, the homestead <coughs> tax exemption was uh, for senior citizens, and uh, it the, to qualify, uh, seniors could not have income over thirty thousand dollars per year. Uh, in, but in Governor Strickland's uh, last budget, he made that. Uh, exemption for everybody and and there's a lot of people that uh, really uh, probably shouldn't have been given that it was just a blanket situation and so what we did was just go back to where it was in the first place bring it back to those with incomes of thirty thousand dollars or less who need that help and finally um, on a related topic to the budget uh, the rainy day fund governor Kasich uh, a couple weeks ago announced that um, nearly a one billion additional dollars were being added to the rainy day fund. Um, in government, there's always pressure coming from everybody. Money should be spent in a certain way, should be saved in a certain way. Um, what's your response to that additional money being in the rainy day fund, and what's the importance of having those reserve funds on hand? The two big pluses of having a rainy day, it's just like at home in our family budgets. We always like to have reserves uh, set aside so that if there's emergencies or contingencies where we need to, to get some cash, we have it in our savings. Same thing here. When you, you, I mean, we have a $62 billion budget, and really, realistically, we should have three three percent uh, minimum set aside to handle emergencies. That would be close to two billion dollars. Having said that, the other big plus of having a, a, a sizable rainy day fund is that it helps with uh, our credit rating, our with the the people we borrow money from. The stronger our 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 financial statement is the better uh, price better interest rates we get uh, because of the strength and, and sound management of our state dollars uh, one of the topics we've um, covered extensively in recent months has since been signed into law um, included in the budget the uh, lake facilities authority is there any update you can give your constituents on that well yes it's just passed it was in the budget and uh, here, of course we're in mid-july so the county commissioners of uh, all glaze and um, uh, mercer are, are in the process of, of passing resolutions to create the uh, LFA and then proceed by, they'll, they'll choose uh, the board of, uh, uh, an advisory board made up of representatives from uh, the political subdivisions in the, in the watershed and impacted area and, and then they'll start uh, putting together a, a long range program to uh, restore Grand Lake St. Mary's. Um, another issue we've talked about in the past, um, on an earlier episode, we talked about a pilot project that would uh, implement VOAG, 4-H, FFA programs in uh, more urban school districts. Uh, can you give us an update on, on how that is going? Yes, that, that amendment was accepted in the budget, is now law, and beginning in the fall of, of 2014, there will be two uh, high schools, in one each in Cleveland and Cincinnati, and an elementary school in each of those cities that will be starting uh, FFA uh, in the high schools and 4-H uh, in two elementaries, where, whereby the students will have an opportunity to learn some, some options at the uh, vocational agricultural standpoint, because it's going to be uh, structured around food science 
not corn and hogs and, and so on in urban areas. And then and the idea is to give uh, students an opportunity to, to learn more uh, and with the opportunity to get jobs in the, in the food business because there's a lot of food processors around and it's an option to get training to become eligible and, and get jobs in, the, in those areas. And then the K through uh, 6, 4-H uh, in the classroom will take place in the fall of 2014 and then they'll start 4-H uh, clubs in those schools. So uh, this is a real opportunity to not only enhance education but also to, to give uh, the students in those schools uh, some values and that they perhaps are not having the opportunity to, to get today and and it just starts building a, a positive uh, uh, structure in those schools. You referenced uh, how these programs could vary um, depending on what part of the state or what mm -hmm. city, country. Um, representing an area that's very rich in its agricultural heritage, can you talk just a little bit about um, how important these programs have been to the students in your district? Mercer County in the 84th House District has the lowest unemployment rate of any county every month. It also is the number one agricultural producing county. There's, it's not coincidence. We have strong families and one of the tenets of those strong families is FFA and 4-H. The, the programs are so solid and so deep in the rural counties that it, it is just unbelievable to supplement the education going on in the classroom and that's why we're so successful in West Central Ohio. Moving on to a different topic, um, one that's very important. Uh, on several occasions previously you've talked about uh, on the issue of Medicaid reform and health care, the importance of the state finding ways to improve health care, reduce costs and ultimately get people off of public assistance in health care. What happens when people are encouraged uh, and ultimately are off of public assistance in health care? Well, of course, uh, the, the big, big uh, uh, focus is on, on giving those people who, who are, are, are more able-bodied, able-minded, the, the incentive to take back responsibility to take better health care of themselves. That's the first thing we're trying to do is get get people well 365 days a year. And then uh, along those lines, we, if, if uh, those folks need additional schooling, we, we want to make that option available. We want to, to make workforce development part of the thing. In other words, part of the, the process. And what that does is it, it gives people the, the self-esteem and the pride of knowing that they're able and ready to get back into the workforce or go into the workforce where they can can have meaningful jobs and provide for their families. It's just, uh, it's it's how uh, how this country was built. Strong families. So you would say there's a strong link between this issue and creating jobs? No question about it. That because right now we have 80,000 unfilled skilled jobs in this state right now. I'm not talking about engineers and PhDs. I'm talking about tradespeople, people who can make stuff. And, and, and that means uh, training uh, just like uh, any other educational aspect. And, and there are jobs right now that are unfilled because we need the, the people qualified to do the work. We're uh, approaching the dog days of summer. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of things have been going on in the district? Well, I've been going to a lot of festivals and ice cream socials, you know, I, I like treats. <laughs> and uh, so now, and then starting this, this, this week, uh, I'll have four out of the next five weeks of county fairs. So. Uh, four counties in the district, and, and I just love to go to the fairs and, and pass out questionnaires because I like to know what's on people's minds. I ask their opinion, and, and I like to know what, what uh, people want from their state government because that really helps me as I work for them here in Columbus. Um, we have about a minute left. You know the drill at the end of the show. How would people uh, contact your office here in Columbus? Well, there's, there's three basic ways to get to, uh, I like communication. Jim Beakey at EmbarkMail.com, Embark with a Q. That's my email address. My phone number is area code 614-466-6344. And Brad, as you know, we do surveys all the time so that if you'd like to Fill out a survey and let us know what you think. HTTP uh, colon slash slash tinyurl, T I N Y U R L dot com slash beaky August. 
we have that information at the bottom of the screen Good. so people can read it as well. Um, Representative, always a pleasure. Thanks for taking some yes, time. Yes, thanks for having me, Brad. I enjoy it always. We look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Ohio in Focus, the program that brings state government to you. Thanks for watching.